Welcome to our fifth uh, video lecture. And oh, well, I try to keep this one short because this is my favorite one. This has been uh, um, my research topic for the past two or three decades is uh, what does evolution say about forming groups and group behavior and how groups and individuals can function most effectively to secure the resources that we need. You know, not what do we want to believe, but what do the hard sciences say about the best ways to acquire the resources that we need to survive? And, and uh, boy, is there a strong tie into ethics here. Um, quick review of, of the previous video, uh, video lecture number four. I think the key thing in there for our semester and for your both personal and, and professional lives is the concept of dilemma. A dilemma is a clash of values. Again, no matter what the solution is, um, it, you know, it's not a choice between right and wrong. It, it's a choice between right and right or wrong and wrong. Because in a dilemma, values are clashing and there just doesn't seem to be a way forward um, without damaging <clears throat> one of your values. That was one of the difficult things to me. I'm sorry, I'm losing my voice. <clears throat> One of the difficult things to me in that Asimov situation was um, I, I was just stunned that I couldn't find a way forward that didn't do damage to something that meant a lot to me. That was a real growing up moment for me. Any, anyway, um, that's the key thing from the previous video. The, the key points for this thing to keep your eye on in, in video number five is our topic is going to be ethics and evolution. What do evolutionary biologists and related professions and professionals tell us about what ultimately I think is ethical behavior? The bottom line of this video, in case I get lost in my own research here, and I'll sure try not to, is this is such good news scientific evidence says that us and you focused relationships win-win relationships outperform me focused relationships in terms of acquiring the resources that we need to survive taking care of other people is good for business and there is now powerful scientific evidence for that um, for millennia the philosophers and the rhetoricians have told us that isocrates who was the most successful of the old Greek rhetoricians, more so even than Aristotle and Plato, um, said that the way you persuade people is, is, is to live your life in a way that helps them, to make sacrifices to help them, because when you need them to listen to you, they will. They're there. They're on your team. That being good to other people ultimately is being good to you. You can see the connection to ethics here. Um, just in case, again, I, I get lost in my own research, here's the connection to ethics. We've been looking at the benefits of ethical behavior. Um, a lot of our values tend to be focused on other people, on taking care of them. That's not true for everyone, but it's true for many of us. In taking care of other people, especially who those who can't, especially taking care of those who can't repay the favor. That turns out to be very good for business. And I'm sorry to be so secular and mercenary about that, but taking care of other people who can't return the favor turns out to be very good for business, for acquiring the resources you need to survive. If taking care of other people is one of your values, part of your ethic system, then operating on your ethical system does lead you to prosperity and happiness. And now it's more than the philosophers and the rhetoricians telling us that. It's the scientists. And I, I am in my research loop, aren't I? Uh, in, in this lecture, we're going to talk about the social instinct, uh, uh, starting with Charles Darwin. We're going to talk about cooperation versus competition in relationships. Guess what? Cooperation wins. And then maybe our big idea here is indirect reciprocity. More on that in just a moment. When we think of Charles Darwin, many of us think of survival of the fittest, uh, dog eat dog world, nature red, and tooth and claw, and and you know fighting our way forward. Only the strong survive. And and in his first book, Origin of Species, um, that was a, a fair description of Darwin's philosophy. Guess what? In the Origin of Species, 1859. 
he didn't touch on human beings. He just left them out of the book uh, for two reasons. One, we were a different kind of species than most others. But two, he was introducing the idea of evolution and thought, let's just stay away from people until this idea has a chance to sink in. So 1871 comes along, Darwin publishes his second book on evolution called The Descent of Man. Sorry about that sexist terminology there. And Darwin's a truth teller. He's not pandering to people. And in that book, he says human beings are different from most other species. We cooperate to survive. When we're talking about human beings, Darwin says, there's a thing called the social instinct that has been developed by natural selection. The social instinct, our willingness to make sacrifices and help each other, is survival of the fittest. We're a cooperative species and we need that to survive. Taking care of other people is good for business, is good for survival. And in The Descent of Man, Darwin writes, I'm looking at the second bullet here, social instinct, he says, will have been increased through natural selection meaning the social instinct is a competitive advantage. Communities with the most sympathetic members would flourish best, rearing the greatest number of offspring. That's usually not what we associate with Darwin, and that is the beginning of evolutionary biologists saying that with human beings, it is not a dog-eat-dog, -dog, cutthroat, selfish world that when we are honoring our values of helping other people, we're actually helping ourselves. So much so that it helps us to survive and we send those helpful genes on into the next generation. And it's not just Darwin saying this. Modern evolutionary biologists strongly echo Darwin. Uh, E.O. Wilson, this last bullet, Wilson just died a month ago, darn it. Um, David Wilson is still very much alive, but these two very famous modern evolutionary biologists, look at this, altruistic groups beat selfish groups, period. Before we wade through this quote where Darwin is still talking about social values and the social instinct, before we wade through it, let me give you some background. Darwin says the social instinct which is cultivated by natural selection because it's a survival advantage. He says it is an instinct, just like hunger. He says it is a biological, physiological instinct, just like hunger. And he says when we don't satisfy our instinct for hunger, we become very uncomfortable. Darwin says that is also what the social instinct is like. If we don't satisfy that instinct to be pro-social and to help others, most of us become uncomfortable. So with that framework, listen to what he says here. As soon as the mental faculties within human beings, early human beings, had become highly developed, that feeling of dissatisfaction or even misery, which invariably results from any unsatisfied instinct, like hunger, would arise as often as it was perceived that the enduring and always present social instinct had yielded to some other instinct. So we don't help somebody else who needs it. Darwin is saying increasingly, increasingly, generation to generation, we're going to feel bad about that. So if one of your values is in some way, shape, or form being helpful to others, when you act on that value, you do increase your happiness. And as we're going to see further in this upcoming information, you increase your chances of resource acquisition and survival and material success. I began researching evolutionary biology and some related disciplines decades ago because it was frustrating to me that public relations, advertising, and marketing weren't looking at those human evolution, human relationship sciences enough um, uh, to see what they told us about how human beings operated and best secured the resources they need to survive. Um, advertising was looking a little bit into anthropology, but it was stopping right there. And so I started doing this research and, and uh, was so pleasantly surprised to, to find out that um, 
it, it wasn't religion, it wasn't philosophy, it wasn't just rhetoric saying take care of other people. It was the hard sciences saying that when we form exchange relationships, as we do in marketing, if we'll go the extra mile to take care of the other people in those relationships, and even people outside of those relationships, we win. Physically, materialistically, in terms of money, in terms of, of um, most measures of success, what would seem to be maybe wasting our resources is actually investing in our success. Again, I hope the connection to ethics here is clear. I thought the stumbling block in my research would be Richard Dawkins, and I kind of avoided him for a few years because he was the very fa he's still alive. He was the very famous author of the best-selling book in evolutionary biology since Charles Darwin, a book called The Selfish Gene. And I was really kind of afraid to read it because I thought Dawkins' research would run counter to Darwin and the others and say, no, selfishness wins. We're selfish people, et cetera, et cetera. Well, that is how Dawkins started out. And I'm, I'm kind of impressed by him because it's hard to change your mind. It's hard to admit you were wrong. And, and Dawkins did that. Here's kind of his progression. He wrote The Selfish Gene in 1976, and now I'm looking directly at our slide here. Uh, in that first edition, he called, it, it's fun to read, human, he said human beings are giant lumbering robots controlled by our selfish genes who will do whatever it takes. They are cutthroat to get into the next generation because genes have one mission, to replicate, to reproduce, and go into the next generation. Um, research in evolutionary biology continues. Thirteen years later, he does the second edition in which he adds a chapter called Nice Guys Finish First. And he wasn't being argumentative or, or ironic. He, he, he wasn't joking. He was looking at this new information and going, wait a minute. People who are cooperative and self-sacrificing and take care of others with no expectation of return, those are the people who are surviving and winning, at least within the human species and a few other social species. And much to his credit, in, in 2006, the, the 30th anniversary of the original edition of The Selfish Gene, Dawkins actually said a better title for the book would have been The Cooperative Gene. And, and that was such a relief to me because here the, the person that I thought would, would really torpedo all this research that I was trying to amass and bring into marketing turned out to be one of the greatest advocates uh, for what I thought was the correct point of view. One of the primary things that changed Dawkins' mind from the selfish gene to the cooperative gene um, was the work of a game theorist uh, named Robert Axelrod. And Axelrod did the coolest thing. He, he invited scholars from all over the world to invent these resource exchange strategies modeled on human behavior. And, you know, how do you enter into a marketing exchange relationship, basically, where resources will be exchanged? Do you demand two for one? Do you, do you bully other people? Do you cheat every third turn? Do you... Um, he, he invited people from all over the world to send in their resource exchange strategies. Um, he programmed all those into a computer where they could compete with one another to see which over the generations, over time, succeeded the most. And, and he ran the results. He, he showed the input to the people who sent there. Everybody agreed. He pushed the button. He did this again several times. He kept getting the same results, and people were having trouble believing it until they started running the experiments and agreed with him. Um, um, several years of research from Robert Axelrod pretty conclusively showed that the most successful resource acquisition and resource exchange strategies, I'm looking at our first bullet here, they are nice, meaning they begin with cooperation, they are forgiving, if your exchange relationship partner isn't behaving that well, you let it go once or twice, maybe with some admonishment, but you keep trying to build the relationship. And if it doesn't work, you break it off and build the wall. You, 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 that's retaliate doesn't mean get even. It just means sever the relationship and move on. Um, that won so many times 
that, that Axelrod almost just quit doing the experiments and, and so did his colleagues. The, the, uh, a real uh, step forward in that kind of research comes from our second bullet. Uh, Martin Novak is the head of evolutionary dynamics at Harvard. And uh, his step forward in all this was to um, use computer generated cooperation strategy or conflict strategies, resource exchange strategies, just randomly generated. How are you going to do business with other people? This is my philosophy or that's my philosophy. The computer would randomly generate those and then just set up the economy and let these people do business and the same strategy won. Over time, the best way to secure the resources through exchange relationships that you need to survive is to be nice, to be forgiving, and if all else fails, then be retaliatory. Um, Novak himself, this last bullet comes from Novak, he said this evidence is so powerful, again this is the head of evolution at Harvard, said this is so powerful that human evolution really has three ingredients. Not all evolution, but human evolution has three ingredients. Variation and natural selection, as Darwin said, but also cooperation. Uh, again, I, I hope the connection to ethics here is, is fairly clear. As Novak and others drilled deeper into why this cooperative, forgiving, retaliatory philosophy beat everything else, they identified a strategy within that that was the most successful strategy within that cooperative strategy called indirect reciprocity. If you look at our first and second bullets, let's look, let's look at direct reciprocity first. Direct reciprocity is A helps B, B helps A. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. Indirect reciprocity is something different. It's assisting others without the expectation that they can or will return your cooperative actions. A helps B. But B can't return the favor, so how do we win? There is a third party, party C, and maybe a whole bunch of Cs, who are observing our behavior, helping someone who can't return the favor. They like what they see. They see us as stand-up, reliable, good people, and they seek to form relationships with us. We show ourselves to be the kind of person they want a long-term exchange relationship with. That's indirect reciprocity. Look at this last bullet. Indirect reciprocity builds reputation, and it wins willing relationship partners who, observe, who have observed how we do business. Almost too good to be true, but it's been proven again and again and again by so many different sciences. This diagram represents that in its simplest form, indirect reciprocity is basically triangular. A helps B. Notice that's a one-way arrow. There's really no expectation or prospect of return. It's not a two-way arrow. Um, so how does A win? Notice that C has observed this, and C reaches out to A to explore the possibility of a, a relationship of a, a resource exchange relationship. So A is indirectly rewarded, not by B, but by C. And time and time again in the experiments of the game theorists, this has been shown to be true. It also has been noted and, and defended by primatologists, by anthropologists, by social psychologists, by sociologists. We could go on and on. The people that said this can't be true, this is not human nature, are the economists. So let's go there. These next slides summarize our reading for this week, so I'll try to dance through this pretty quickly, but I'm so entertained by this, obviously. Um, um, economists had great trouble believing indirect reciprocity because that's not how we work. We look out for number one. It's all about us. Um, from the year 2000 to about 2018, they did 14 studies challenging indirect reciprocity, and every one of them <laughs> proved that, oh, that is how humans do business, and it gave birth to a whole new division of economics called behavioral economics that study not how should we behave, but how do we really behave, and we behave along the lines of indirect reciprocity. So just go through the bullets with me. What did these studies find? Much to the economists' uh, surprise, they found out that indirect reciprocity exists and is very powerful. Um, 
<laughs> Second bullet, hey, it runs counter to our theories. Well, who knew? Um, again, just like Dawkins, to their credit, they admitted they were wrong. Uh, that, that really impresses me, so I'm going to quit making fun of them. They said that the motivations, look at this next one, for indirect reciprocity exceed eventual material benefits. Their studies even showed that this is part of human nature, just as Darwin said, even if it doesn't mean we're winning. It's just now who we are genetically. The next bullet, they said that indirect reciprocity confused basic social instinct, just as Darwin said, and strategic thinking. We know it's good for business to do this. So we can do it for two reasons. It's good for business, and also it's just our basic human nature. On that last point, studies showed, and again, this is in our reading for the week, um, even if people observing us, let's go back to the triangle, we're A, we're helping B, C is observing us, even if C knows that we're doing this because it's just good for business, C doesn't hold that against us. C still seeks out a relationship with us. That's how powerful indirect reciprocity is. Um, Okay, more from The Economist, bless their hearts. Um, first bullet here, reputation management is the main driver of the functioning of indirect reciprocity. It's all about building reputation that leads to relationships. Uh, this next one, fascinating to me, indirect reciprocity can be negative, involving punishment. If C, at the bottom of that triangle, sees A mistreating B, C is willing to spend her own resources to retaliate. Um, she'll get nothing out of punishing A, but she still punishes A because that social instinct is so strong. Um, second to last bullet, indirect reciprocity can survive misinterpretations of reputation. Um, as long as it's our style of doing business, um, we can survive some misunderstanding of that by people on social media or, or elsewhere. And, and last from The Economist, indirect reciprocity builds cooperation within a socioeconomic environment. More on that in just a moment. There's, there's a way that this can filter throughout the culture besides how it comes back and benefits us. In this lecture, we focused mainly on evolutionary biology and, um, and economics, but I keep tossing out these hints that it's not just those two professions. This really is coming from sociology and primatology and social psychology and, and so many other ologies. But uh, within the past year, there's just been such a cool study from social psychology that we, we need to mention this. It's a massive study. What these social psychologists did was get all these huge data sets from all these other studies and combine them. And basically, they were asking the question, OK, do people who practice indirect reciprocity, who make sacrifices to help other people without the expectation of return, do those people really win? Let's look at all these massive studies from different nations and different times, put all the information together, crunch the numbers, and they said, you know what, it's indisputable. Look at the two uh, sub-bullets here. People who practice indirect reciprocity have more children over the course of a lifetime meaning that simply in terms of evolution, they are the survival of the fittest. They are the fittest. And then in terms of marketing, look at this next sub-bullet. They earn more money over the course of a lifetime. It's getting so, I was going to say it's hard to find a science that attacks indirect reciprocity. I can't find one. All these people that are saying, let's see if this is really how human beings function, do the research and say, oh, that's kind of unexpected. Who knew? In fact, what all these studies say, here's an important point. What all these studies say is this is who we are as human beings, but we have trouble believing that. All these studies add that bullet, that, that, that my last point there, that we don't think this is who we are. And so that's something that if you're trying to instill a philosophy like this within whatever marketing unit you're in, you're going to encounter that. People saying, well, I wish this is how we were, but that's not who we really are. Um, yes, it is really who we are. Science after science shows this. And so I hope, I hope you can be equipped with the information to push back and say it sounds too good to be true, but it's not. Um, in any way, survival of the fittest, this last bullet, is, is uh, people who practice indirect reciprocity.
And again, I'll try to quit saying this. I hope the connection to ethics here is clear, that taking care of other people is a reward of ethics, of, of ethical behavior. Ah, don't don't scream when you see this this diagram. My brain usually freezes when I see something like this. But I had told you that I had been doing this research for a while and studying science after science to see what they say about indirect reciprocity. And I, I thought I'd show you the extended model of it where it stands right now. That golden triangle there is our original indirect reciprocity. A helps B, a whole bunch of Bs we hope, and is rewarded by a whole bunch of Cs. There's our golden triangle right there. Um, what, what new research from all these other ologies, psychology, social, social psychology, um, sociology, primatology, I, I'm, I'm leaving too many of them out here, um, in addition to evolutionary biology and economics, it shows that those C's down at the bottom uh, also like to help out partners of A. That A2 way up at the top, C will be so impressed by our actions, they'll even like our friends. And so there's some payback there. Look at B now within the triangle. There's another form of indirect reciprocity, uh, generalized indirect reciprocity, where B pays it forward. When B gets on its feet, maybe with help from A, instead of repaying A, it pays it forward to D, who pays it forward to E, and every one of those becomes its little triangle. If you can see the XXX, well, XXX just noticed that B helped D and the triangle starts over. Oh, we like the way B does behavior. Let's reward them. You can see Y, Y, Y rewarding the D. So you can see how that pay it forward. Each one starts its own little triangle. There's even evidence from uh, social psychology that when C rewards A, Back to our original triangle, F observes that and rewards C. Um, um, we ended the previous slide by saying this can pervade an entire culture, and and this this is how that uh, pervasiveness happens. End of complicated diagram. Well, let's end with a big so what. What what does all this mean? Um, Indirect reciprocity is ethical, other-centered behavior that leads to rewards. That's why we're talking about this. Um, um, not all ethical behavior is other-centered, um, but we're going to discover that, that a lot of the values, the, the key core values that we hold, really do focus on, on other people. For example, I've discovered that I cannot be happy. Two of my core values, I'm not trying to be a good guy here, but, but two of my core values are being a good husband and being a good father. And it's almost like I'm looking out for number one, because if I'm not doing those two things, I can't be happy. And yet those still are other-centered values. So, so other-centered behavior, especially in the form of indirect reciprocity, not expecting a return, leads to happiness because we're satisfying our social instinct. And all these sciences, one after the other, say that such behavior leads to productive relationships. Uh, in, in terms of money, in terms of material success, uh, boy, what a reward for ethical behavior. This last diagram is um, comes from an article that I just did, not the reading, but another article I did for Public Relations Review. But I, I think this also applies to, to marketing. And it's, it's the six R's of our business. I, I'm sorry it's so clever, but all these concepts really do start with R. Our business starts with research and reflection, who we are and what we want. Um, probably then in dealing with others, look at number two, we move to reciprocity, both direct and indirect reciprocity. That leads to reputation. People like the way we do business. That reputation leads to long-term successful exchange relationships, number four. And those relationships lead to resources, which um, just in the most materialistic sense is what business and life is all about, getting the resources that we need to survive. Uh, the reason for all those arrows in the middle is I don't think it's this linear. These can jumble all around, but they're all feeding each other. And I, I frankly think the most important one in there is that reciprocity square, direct and indirect reciprocity. 
if we're focusing on that, chances are things over time are going to go well for us. And we'll leave it there with that focus on the rewards of that particular form of ethical behavior.